Jeremiah chapter 17, and we are going to read verses 5 through 8. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. I'll begin with verse 5. And please join me on verses 6, and we'll finish together on 8. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you again for bringing us together tonight. I pray that your word would draw us closer together and closer to you as well. And God, please bless those that tune in online and hear your word preached and taught, I pray that your Holy Spirit would not only speak to us, but to them as well, and that this may reach those who uh, would not normally darken the doors of a church, and that you would speak to their hearts, and any that hear this and don't know Christ as their Savior, God, may they understand and get to know their need uh, for salvation and, and be born again. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You hold your finger there in Jeremiah. Uh, you can turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. I'm going to read a few other verses from there. Uh, <clears throat> and then I'll come back to Jeremiah. And we'll go forward to Psalm 1. And beginning in verse 1, uh, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3 says this, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This similar statement here where it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Now let's go back to Jeremiah. <clears throat> because there's a similar uh, comparison here uh, that was made between somebody who is planted by the rivers of water and somebody who's suffering in desert time. Uh, verse 8 says, For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. I want to talk a little bit about the year of the drought. The year of the drought. I want to make just some statements about it because God says, here's a tree that's going to be fine um, and is not going to have to worry or be concerned or anxious uh, in the year of the drought. And that word careful, we think that means how you're supposed to walk across the ice. Uh, but in the Bible, when we see that word careful, it means full of care, or full of worry. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, give thanks. And what he's saying there is, he's not saying don't be careful as you walk, or be careful as you do this or that. He's saying, don't be full of worry, or don't be full of care. It's like not having a care in the world. That's a person who's not uh, fretting over every little thing. So that's the, that's the meaning of the, of the word, when we see it in the Bible. Words have changed meaning a little bit over time, and it's good to, uh, it's not something that I'm trying to correct the Bible, I'm just saying when it was translated into English, that's what that word meant in English. And <clears throat> so he's saying, here's a tree, it's, it's not worried, it's not concerned, and yet it is in the midst of the year of the drought. And, and uh, it's interesting, it doesn't say a year of the drought, but the year of the drought. And that tells us that it's something very specific that happens. A drought comes along. 
And, and I want to say some things about that. I want to say, first of all, not if, but when. Not if, but when. In other words, it's not if the year of the drought comes along, but when the year of the drought comes along. Here's a tree that, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, is that tree's going to be okay. That tree's going to make it. Now, there's a contrast here. Back in verse 6, it says, talking about the man who, who trusts in the arm of another man, he's got his faith and trust in, in humans, or humanity even, and verse 6 says, For he shall be like the heath in the desert. Now, a heath is not a tree. It's a small little shrub with little skinny leaves, and there's not much benefit that you can get from a heath. Now, a tree you can get benefit from, especially if it's hot out. It's nice to sit under the shade of a tree. Uh, I know somebody once that said, Wow, you folks, they were talking about somebody out, that lived out in the country, said, you, You've got it made out here. All these trees around. And when it gets hot, those trees can just flap their branches and cause a breeze to come through here. And they sincerely believe that that's what made the breeze come through that area. Uh, they didn't realize it's the breeze that causes the branches to kind of flap like that. But, uh, but okay, uh, that's not... Uh, I've, I've heard of people that are shocked to know as they look at the calendar, Thanksgiving is going to land on a Thursday again this year. It just worked out that way. And, uh, and they haven't figured out it's not a date. <laughs> Thanksgiving lands on a Thursday all the time. And, uh, but anyhow, um, the trees can, you can get benefit from, uh, from, from the shade that they provide. And there's some refreshment there. And this particular uh, tree, the Bible says, it's just like it's one planted by the waters. And so there's a water nearby. But anyways, that heath, so there's a contrast there. A little tiny shrub with little skinny leaves or a nice big strong tree that's grown up tall and spreads out its leaves and branches and they're nice big full leaves and it's providing some good shade. But it's not if the drought happens, but when. And we've, we've got to be ready for that. And, and uh, uh, a year where there's a, where there's a lack, where there's a wanting. And, and we can look through the Bible and see person after person after person and they were not exempt from the year of the drought in their life. I mean, we can, we can look at Job, and, and I think he had about 30 years worth of drought all packed into one. And, I mean, just in, in one day, all ten of his children are, are wiped out. I mean, dead. And all of his wealth is wiped out. And it's just that all the different accounts, and he was diversified, had his wealth in different places. It didn't have all his eggs in one basket. I mean, he had donkeys and he had camel and he had other livestock and, and, and uh, just, a, just a variety of it. And he had people in charge of each of those areas of his businesses. And one by one, they were coming in. And as one finished talking, another one burst through the doors and was catching his breath and then saying, hey, you're the, we had a horrible thing. And we lost all of the livestock. We lost all the camels. We lost all the oxen. We lost all the donkeys we lost, and, and all the sheep and, and everything. And, and all the employees are dead or scattered. And I'm the only one left to come and give this report. And, and, uh, and the Bible doesn't say this, but I think they kind of looked around and and as the last guy comes in and tells him, Job, you're completely and utterly 100% broke, they may have looked at each other and said, well, I guess there's not much left here for us. <laughs> I mean, his next check is going to bounce. And he very well have, may have lost them also. We, we hear nothing else said about them in the rest of the book. And Job went through the year of the drought. All of his wealth left him. All of his children died. The comfort of his wife was not there. And, and not just the comfort, but she was actually kind of advising him to do something wrong. And sometimes when people are hurting, they give bad advice. And it's just a reaction, it's a knee reaction, and, and I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm glad Job didn't hold that against her. I'm sure she is too. 
But, but again, Job set a good example in not holding that against her. I'm sure she was glad he didn't hold that against her. And I'm sure she went, later on said, you know what, I'm sorry I said that to you. And he said, too late, got to have ten more kids. <laughs> God's giving me everything back. Uh, we can look at Joseph in, in the book of Genesis, sold into slavery by his own brothers. It was his own flesh and blood. And they, they hate and despise him so much that they have first, their plan A, let's just kill him. And one of them says, ah, you know what, I don't want to do that. That sounds a little, uh, a little extreme. Not a whole lot extreme, but a little extreme. That's going a little bit too far. Let's just throw him in this hole and, until we can figure out. Uh, but he's sold into slavery. And then from slavery, he goes into prison. That's a year of the drought. And you'll be hard-pressed to find anything negative said about Joseph. But he went through a year of a drought. You'll be... Uh, uh, God kind of had a talk with, with Job and said, Job... It's interesting. When he was talking to Job, he said things a little bit different than when he was talking about Job. Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in all the earth? But when he's talking to Job, he says, Hey, Job, you're so smart. <laughs> who hung the stars? And, and who created all the beasts of the ocean and, and the birds in the air and the beasts of the field? Who made all this? And whose power holds it all together? And, and, and Job realized, yeah, I'm not as smart, I'm not as good, I'm not as, as, as good a Christian as I thought I was. And by the time he, God was finished talking to him, Job said, I've got some cleaning up to do in my life. And he wound up closer to God. And, and, uh, but he went through that year of the drought. Joseph went through that year of the drought. Daniel went through a time of drought or the year of the drought as he is a young man minding his own business, living in, in his homeland, home country. And all of a sudden the invading forces come through and they say, you're coming with us. And they take him to a foreland, separate him from his family, separate him from his teachers, from his parents, from his friends and, and, and brothers and sisters and cousins and, and everybody. And they say, now, you're going to have a new diet. You're going to eat all new food. And this food is going to be food that has been sacrificed to our gods because it looks like our God beat your God because that's why you're the one that's captured. And so you're going to have to convert. And he said, no, I'm not going to convert. Uh, I, I would rather go with the worst tasting stuff you can offer me. I, you know, I've never seen pulse on a menu anywhere. And if I did see it, I'd say, do you have a cheeseburger? <laughs> but he, he opted for that instead of eating from the king's table. He's now in a new culture. A new language has to be learned. And then they said, we're going to change your name. And that's so very often all those things are tools used to reprogram people or what we call brainwash people. People that go into a cult. They say, we're going to change your diet. We're going to change how you dress. Uh, we're, this is going to be a different culture. You might have to learn some new terms, a different way of speaking, and let's give you a new name while you're here. Your old life is all gone, all your old contacts. No, you can't go back to see your family and your parents. You're in here in the compound with us now. And it's, it's a mind-controlling, uh, uh, brainwashing technique. And it's nothing new. It was going on back in the chapter 1 of Daniel. He was in a year of drought, but he, he purposed in his heart, the Bible says. And his companions said, they purposed in their heart. But it, it started with one. They said, you know what, if he's going to take a stand, I'm going to take a stand. And yes, I'm going to take a stand. But there was many others that were captured. Who knows what their names were? Because they didn't take a stand. They went along with it. They said, don't cause waves. We can have it good here if we just go along to get along. And they never accomplished a thing for the Lord. But as a result of Daniel's stand, Nebuchadnezzar got saved. And by the way, Daniel got to be his right-hand man.
But at the beginning, he's in a year of drought. David gets anointed to be the next king. And then until he becomes king, he spends the rest of that time running for his life. I mean, there's a short little time in there where he got to live in Saul's house and uh, the current king and got to see how people came in and went out and saw the, the way being a king, you know, how he had to run things and, and became very close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, and then Saul became very angry and hateful and, and, and murderous towards him. And he said, well, I've got I to flee for my life. And for years he spent on the, on the road, on the run. And then he became king. And then his own son, one of his own boys, turned against him. He started turning the people against him and led a revolt against him. And as his son's kicking down the front door, uh, uh, David and his men are saying, let's just quietly go out the side door and, and leave town. I'm not going to go to war against my own boy. And, and it's, you know, his, his men said, your boy has no fighting experience. The people he's coming with have no fight. We could, we could put this down and put an end to it right now. He said, no, I'm not going to go to war against him. That's a year of drought. Your own child turns against you and turns others against you. That's a difficult time. The king is, is going after you. That's a difficult time. Paul in the New Testament was shipwrecked, snake bitten, stoned. I mean, had rocks thrown at him until he was dead. Thrown into jail again and again. Beaten. Went through a year of drought. You know, some people are going to miss out at the judgment seat of Christ because they quit in the middle of the year of the drought. A year of the drought came into their life and they said, this is more than what I can take. I'm done and I quit. You know what I found? And I won't use personal illustrations here, although there's plenty of them. But what I found again and again and again and again is just before the end of that drought, just before the rain starts up again, is when it gets the hottest. That's when Satan says, I've got to turn the heat up. They haven't quit yet. I've got to turn the heat up. I've got to make it harder. I've got to pour this on a little bit more. If I can just get them to quit. Because he sees the he sees over on the other side. Here come some rain clouds. And we can't see them yet. And so know this. Hey, if you're in the year of the drought. And, and it's getting harder and harder and harder. Guess what? It's about to rain for you. Don't give up now. If it's, if it's just kind of hot a little bit. Don't give up then either. Because there's going to be a lot of people that said, Oh, if I had just... One more day, one more hour, one more week, one more month. I heard a fellow uh, talk about a good friend of his in Bible college. He and his good friend uh, got married about the same time. Jessica's got a good, an ongoing count of all of her classmates that have already gotten married. And uh, uh, she'll update you on that if, if you want. Uh, but she, yeah, I've got, and she'll tell you exactly how many days and hours she has left until her wedding. And then she says, and this person got married before me, and this person, and this person, and this person. Uh, but none of them married your man, so you're still good to go. Uh, but uh, uh, these, these two fellows, good friends in college, graduated at the same time, got married with, within a month or two of each other. They were each other's best men and after just a year or two of marriage the one fellow's wife got very very sick very sick and I mean bedridden very very ill and uh, of course her husband got discouraged and he he had they hadn't been married very long. He's looking forward to the rest of his life and the rest of her life and then growing old together. And now she's bedridden. And he went to, to, his, to his friend or maybe his friend came to him to visit or something and he said, I don't, know, I don't know if I can take this. 
He said, it's not what I signed up for. He said, you promised. He said, I stood with you when you said for better, for worse. When you said for richer, for poorer. When you said the words in sickness and in health. And this is, this is a sickness. You promised. You took an oath before God. And you took an oath before me and the other men that were standing beside us. And before all the people gathered together. Your family and her family. He said, now, you keep your word and be a man. And the man said, I don't know if I can. By the way, that's the job of the best man to do that. It's not just there to hold the reins and hand them to the groom. He's saying, I'm standing with you and supporting you. And I'm going to try to, if need be, hold you to your word on this. He said, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he quit during the year of his drought. He quit. He filed for a divorce and got it. She was in no shape to fight over it and to try to stop it. And, and so it was quick. He got a divorce quickly. And a week later, she died. One more week. One more week, and people would have said, God bless you for staying with your wife all the way through that year of the drought. One more week, and he'd have been a hero, but he gave up. And he'll forever be a zero. That, that, that will stay with him. If I'd have just stayed one more week, one more, hey, in the middle of the year of the drought, towards the end of the year of the drought, you don't know when that year ends. But just stay with it. Just stay with it. You're not the only one that's gone through here. It's not if it happens. It is going to happen at some point in time. And, and realize you're not the first one. And you're not the only one. And you won't be the last one to face the year of the drought. And that might not be the last year you'll ever have to face. Jesus went through a time of drought. He went to Gethsemane. Jesus saw his good friend Lazarus dead. And Lazarus' sisters had sent word to him and said, Go get Jesus because tell him that his friend Lazarus is on the verge of death. And, and uh, so they went they delivered the message. And Jesus tarried and was there for a few more days. And he came back and they said, You're too late. He's dead. He's gone. He said, Take me to where he's buried. And they took him out. And, and uh, uh, he said, Now, uncover it and roll that stone away. And they said, Lord, by now, he stinketh. He's not embalmed. He's in there and he's, he's in bad shape. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Called him by name. If he had just said, come forth, all the graves would have been emptied that day. He said, Lazarus, come forth. But he still faced, the Bible says, Jesus wept. Later on, Jesus was betrayed. Not by some stranger. One of his own disciples. He was beaten. While he's being beaten, he's denied by another one of his disciples. Then he faces the crucifixion and he's forsaken. And the disciples, the one that denied him, said, I go fishing. And then the others said, we go also. And so he was left and abandoned. It's not if. If Jesus himself would face a year of drought, don't think for a minute that you and I will be immune. They don't just pass over us. We'll all face it at some point in time. So what is a drought? Well, a drought is very simply a lack of rain. A time when the showers of blessing are not happening. It's a drought. Keep in mind, a lean time doesn't mean God isn't being good to you. God's always good to us. I love what, what Brother Jenkins said, and he we got to hear him preach last year, and he talked a little bit about uh, his son passing away and how they were got to be with him in the hospital, and God worked things out. And, and he kept making a statement. He said, God was never on trial in all of this. What an encouraging testimony. I don't remember a word he said in the preaching. <laughs> I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and look at the, uh, find where the videos are, buy the, the DVDs or something to find out what sermons he preached. But I remember him saying this, 
Every time he stood behind the pulpit, he said, God was never on trial in all of that. And I thought, that's as it should be. Boy, if that wasn't a year of drought for him, and for him to be able to say, God was never on trial. Uh, hey, it, just because there's a drought doesn't mean God's not still being good to you. Let's take a look at how to survive a year of the drought. Look at verse 8. It says, For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green. And shall not be careful in the year of the drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Huh. You know, verse 8 doesn't focus on the devastation of the drought but on the good health of the tree. See, it's not circumstances that determine what happens to you in the year of the drought. The year of the drought, that is the circumstances. But here, what's focused on is the health of the tree. And that's what makes the difference. You know, in both passages, uh, right here in Jeremiah and in Psalms, there's nothing about rain. It talks about rivers. It talks about the tree being planted by, the, by a river. And a river is, uh, well, that's a good thing to have when there's no rain. It's just water that's been stored up somewhere and it's taken it this long to get down to here. It's water that's coming perhaps from another land where there is rain. But now it's coming down here. It's a reservoir of water. It's something that's been saved up. Hey, we ought to save something up for the year of the drought. We ought to save something up in our spiritual life for that time when things are not going well. We ought to have something that we have, we have studied and we have made sure I can look back on that and know this is something good, this is something special, this is something to keep me going. Very great verse, the Bible talks about David encouraged himself. Why? He was going through a time of drought. His men said, it's your fault. Our wives and children have been taken captive. We're going to kill you. <laughs> if it weren't for you, they'd still be here. We'd still be uh, enjoying their company and they'd be safe and we wouldn't be uh, worried or, or, you know, it may be we never see them again. It's all your fault. They're, the men were speaking about killing David. David got so desperate, he went to the priest and said, what should I do? <laughs> Gotta find me a man of God. What should I do? And, and, and uh, uh, he came back out and said, hey, we're going after him. We're going to get our families back. And they did. You know, there was later times in David's life he could look back on that and say, you know what? God came through back then. He'll come through again. God came through back then. He'll come through again. There ought to be a reservoir. You've got to make a reservoir. You've got to make a reservoir. And sometimes we shield our children from the bad things that are going on in our life. And I think perhaps we do them a disservice when we do that. It's okay. Now, my parents never gave me specifics about how much money was in the bank account. Because I know I would have thought, wow, we are wealthy beyond imagination. And that just was not the case. But I think it's, I think it's funny when you hear when you hear 14 year olds say, "I'm making lots of money, six bucks an hour." <laughs> I mean, I am breaking it in. Okay. <laughs> I've got a hundred dollars saved up in my checking account right now. I'm wealthy beyond imagination. And then you know, to a child. $100 is a lot of money. In fact, to an adult, Dad always said $5 is a lot of money if you don't have it. And I, I, I understand what he was talking about there. But I do remember times when overhearing Mom and Dad talking about finances. And, and uh, I remember Dad saying the statement, sometimes we have a lot of month left over at the end of the money. And my parents got paid once a month, and that money had to last the whole month, and that money had to pay 
for the bills of the church. I mean, there was support that they lived on, but also the ministry. Until the church was established and it was up and running and, and self-sustaining, that money came from the support. The support was divided into the personal fund and the, the work fund. And even after the church was self-sustaining, that money was still going to the work fund, and they said, we can't, we can't buy groceries out of the work fund. Uh, it's got to go towards the work, towards the ministry. But I remember them talking about that. And I know that the lady that was running, uh, uh, taking care of sending checks out to the missionaries at the mission office, her name was Mrs. Schmidt. And so in my great understanding of how money worked as a five-year-old, our money came from Mrs. Schmidt. And because I had heard Dad say, uh, Mrs. Schmidt deposited the money into our account, so it's there. And so I had it figured out. Mrs. Schmidt was the source of money. And I remember hearing them talk about being low on funds and this and that. And I said, there's no big deal. Just call Mrs. Schmidt. Have her put some more money in the account. <laughs> and I got my head patted and go play. <laughs> And everything. But you know what? I think my parents did well to let me overhear that. That there was lean times. Because through all that, I don't remember there ever being a time that we sat down at the table where there wasn't food. There was always something to eat. I didn't, I didn't know we were poor until after I graduated high school. And, and I'm not kidding about that. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, when I was growing up, we were so poor. He said, how poor were you? I said, we stayed out in the parking lot at KFC and we licked other people's fingers when they came out. Uh, that's how poor we, we weren't quite that poor. Uh, Carl Hatch was that poor. <laughs> He's the one that originally told me that story. Uh, but uh, uh, I didn't know. I didn't know all the stuff. When I was here in school, we qualified for free lunches. Mom always packed my lunch. Just put it in the lunch box or in a brown paper bag and went to school with it. I got to see God take care of us. They didn't shield me completely from that. And I think we perhaps do our children a disservice by shielding them from that drought and from the and so they never get to see God get the glory and the praise and the thanks for getting us through that. And because when that happens, that builds up a reservoir for them. And they can go on in their life and later on tell somebody, you know what, we're going to be okay. This is nothing compared to what I saw God bring my parents through back in the day. And if, if we serve the same God, and we do, and He could bring them through that, and He did, He can get us through this ourselves. And you build up your own reservoir, and you let your kids borrow from it, and let them learn something from it as well. I've said before, verse 6 mentions a heath. That's the person who is trusting and relying on other people. And then there's a tree in verse 8. And what is the difference? Well, the location. The location. The heath is out in the middle of the desert. And the tree said, I'm going to stay right here by the water. And Jesus told the lady by Sychar's well, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, you would ask me for water. And he's the river of life. And he's the water of life. See, one was dependent on rain. And what happens when there's no rain? Well, you wither up. And the other one bloomed and produced fruit whether there was rain or no. So I don't need rain. I've got a river. i got a river. I've got that water. Jesus prayed and asked God to wash us by the water, uh, uh, or to uh, uh, cleanse us by the washing of the water of His Word. Well, you put root down in this right here, and you'll have a never-ending source of water in the year of drought. That same word for the word heath, and it's translated correctly. I'm not trying to change what the King James Bible says, that it's a heath, but in the Hebrew word, it means heath, but it also means naked or destitute. 
There's, it's, it's providing no shade. There's nothing, uh, you can't even take leaves off of it and make tea. It's naked and destitute. The land that it was in is parched and it's dry and uninhabited. But that other one said, I'm, I'm going to be by the, by the water, by the rivers. In verse 8 we see a tree. It's planted. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters. Spreads out its roots. <clears throat> That's strength and stability. And its location is by the river. Without water, there's no life. There's no life. And it goes on and says, Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So that tree is going to be productive as long as it stays right there with its source of water. Both those trees went through the drought. What made the difference is their source. One tree represents people whose source of strength was the arm of flesh. We've seen that song. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Your own arm or the arm of somebody else. You dare not trust your neighbors or, or your fellow humans. The other tree said it represents a person that said, I'm going to be dependent on God. On God. My help cometh from above. And Jesus is that water of life. It's not a matter of, hey, you'll need this if you go through a year of drought. Um, it's not an if. It's not an if. You'll need this just in case you ever have to face a problem. <laughs> That's not an if. You'll need this in case there's ever turmoil in your life. Hey, our country is headed for turmoil. There are already 9,000 illegal aliens headed this way. So far, there's 9,000. And they've just come in uh, getting close to Mexico. Now, as they continue to go, that number will grow and grow. They plan on being, they want to be at our border by the time Biden takes office. Because they know he's not going to do anything about it. That's the first wave. 9,000. They're estimating that during his presidency we could get as many as 11 million illegals added to our country. That's problems. That's problems. They're not, they're not going through the proper channel. They're not doing it right. They're breaking the law. We have, for an estimate, the potential of getting 11 million criminals being here. And our government's reaction will be nothing. They'll say, well, let's just uh, let's register them to vote. Folks, we're headed for problems. We're headed for problems. Because once the people that want to see us harmed realize, hey, they've opened the floodgate again, let's just march right in with these people. And we could build bombs while we're there. We can buy all that stuff. and They'll never have papers on us. They won't know who or what, where we came from. What are we going to do? Hey, let's just stay right here. Let's stay right here. And we won't have to worry about those things. Careful for nothing. Because this is where our hope is. Right here. What are we do in that year drought? We stay in the Bible. That's what we'll do. Let's stand tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed.
Bible foretold, Jesus himself foretold a lot of the problems that the world is going to face before he comes back. Those problems are on their way. And I don't mean that caravan is all those problems. I mean the pestilence and the earthquakes and famines. Those problems are on their way. They're on their way. But that doesn't have to shake us. It doesn't have to rattle us. It doesn't have to destroy us or, or hinder our growth. We can put our roots down and have them spread out. We can reach our branches up. And we can be a people that offers refreshment and protection to those around us. They can receive some respite from the heat. But it will take us staying true to our God and to His Word. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word, for Your instruction for the contrast you give between those that trust in you and those who choose to place their trust elsewhere. God, help us to do as Daniel did and purpose in his heart to stay true to you. To do as others throughout the Bible, example after example after example, who face their own years of drought. And we saw you bring them through it. God, may that serve as the beginning of our reservoir. Lord, may we add to it ourselves. That we can look back to whatever the next year of drought that we face. And see that you got us through that. And know that you'll get us through the next one. Bless this invitation. God, speak to our hearts. And may we speak to you and respond as we should. But we ask it in Jesus' name. It's a piano place. If God spoke in your heart, I'm sorry. At the very least, pray and say, God, the next year of the drought, help me through that. By your grace, by your arm, I'll stay true to you. safely. Return us again at the appointed hour. We pray you bless uh, Wednesday night service as we study the, the revelation of Jesus. I pray that you would help us to gain a better understanding of Him and to love Him evermore. We ask it all in His name. Amen. Lord bless you.